Good morning. Thank you for coming out today. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. We have a terrific program for you today on a, a burning issue, the use of peacekeeping forces or the possible use of peacekeeping forces in Donbass to try and end the conflict. Uh, I'd like to thank um, the SCM Corporation for sponsoring today's event. Uh, I'd like to thank Damon Wilson, our Executive Vice President, for being with us this morning. Oh, and Mike Carpenter, welcome. Uh, again, we have an all-star panel. Uh, the hashtag for following us is Future Europe. And um, I will ask, Ukraine. sorry, future, future Ukraine. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> it's always good to have one's back covered. <laughs> Thank you. That's true, that's true. OK. Um, our keynote speaker this morning is Ambassador Kurt Volker, former ambassador to NATO, f former senior director at the National Security Council, and someone who understands very well what's going on in Ukraine and what's necessary to help bring peace to Ukraine. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Kurt, and then I'll mention the speakers, the panelists, after Kurt speaks. Thank you. Thanks, John. It, yeah, you'll be happier there, believe me. <laughs> um, thank you very much, John, for the invitation and the opportunity to say a few words at the start of the discussions today. Um, and thanks to Damon, and good to see a lot of friends here. Um, and I look forward to a rich discussion. In thinking about issues generally, and then thinking specifically about Ukraine, uh, a couple things come to mind. Uh, one of them, it's important to remember. Second is it's important to speak clearly about things. And third, it's important to uh, be proactive, to figure out what it is we ought to be doing. So I want to start with that as a framework and just say a couple of things. Uh, first off, we have to remember how we got to the discussion that we're having today. Uh, Ukraine was a peaceful country for 20 some years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. May not have been successful, may not have been free of corruption, may not have been economically developing as it should, may not have been as unified in a sense of national purpose and identity as it should have, but there wasn't fighting, there wasn't killing, there wasn't a separation of people within the country, there wasn't ethnic conflict, there wasn't ethnic hatred. Uh, it was a country, flawed, problematic, aspirations, never enough, but nonetheless, it was a country. Uh, what we saw in uh, 2014 was uh, with the shootings on the Maidan, we saw the president of the country call out forces to kill people, be rejected as president by the parliament of the country, and flee the country. After that, there was also not massive violence in the country ethnic conflict, separation, and so forth. It was still a country traumatized, now with a new government, trying to look forward. What we then saw was the insertion of, we all remember the phrase now, if we think back, the little green men, uh, the intelligence forces, the operatives, the agitation in order to create a separatist movement in Crimea, a place that had been happily part of Ukraine, but with a Russian military base, leased until 2047, not at risk of being turned over to anyone else, uh, not at risk of being taken away from Russia. And yet there was an agitation there, and that quickly escalated into a breakaway movement, a, ref a, a staged referendum, a declaration of independence, and a recognition by Russia followed immediately by annexation by Russia. This is the start of all this. Um, that is something that is shocking to a Western or a global uh, political order. Countries just invading other countries, taking territory by force and annexing it. Kind of thing we haven't seen in Europe uh, since the 1930s. That was the beginning of all this. What that launched was, for the first time, a serious Western response to this Russian aggression. And it resulted in sanctions. I see Dan Fried here, who helped put those together against all expectations of his bosses at the time. But he succeeded. Uh, and that was very important. And I think what's even more important is that an international community has maintained a perspective 
uh, about Russia's illegal occupation, annexation of Crimea, and the need to have sanctions in place and to push back on that for over three and a half years now. So that is a, a measure to which I think it is generally recognized that this is unacceptable and needs to be reversed. But it didn't stop there. The next thing that happened was a repeat in eastern Ukraine in the Donbas. And that is a conflict that is still going on. Just to put a fine point on it, 2017 has been the most violent year of the conflict since it began. We think of this starting in 2014, and a lot of people think that this has somehow uh, turned into a sleepy, frozen conflict, and it's stable, and now we have Minsk agreements, and there's a ceasefire, and so it's, it's a problem, but it's not a, it's not a crisis. That's completely wrong. It is a crisis. Uh, this has been the most violent year, 2017. And frankly, last night was one of the most violent nights in eastern Ukraine, uh, certainly since February, and one of the most violent this year. Uh, that is a travesty. Now, what is happening here is Russia is continuing to deny its own role in this. And this is why this has been so difficult to resolve from the beginning. Uh, Russia has insisted that it has nothing to do with the forces that it has created, that it commands, that it controls, with the separatist governments that it has set up, th that it changes the leaders out of at will, as they did in Luhansk just last month. Uh, Russia is pretending not to be there. It's insisting that the Normandy process, France and Germany with Ukrainian and Russian presidents, deal with the Luhansk and Donetsk representatives that Russia has created as though they are equal and legitimate partners. It's insisting that Ukraine do that. In the effort to find out whether Russia would be willing to change course and withdraw its forces and have a peacekeeping force in the area, uh, Russia has said, no, uh, you need to deal with the Luhansk and Donetsk people as well. And that would have only the effect of legitimizing their presence and perpetuating the conflict from where we already are. So the first thing I said was to remember, this is how we got where we are. The second thing, as I said, is then to speak frankly about it. And I just have a bit, but let me add one more point to this. A resolution in eastern Ukraine means peace for the people that live there, the ability to return to their homes, the resumption of normal life, normal governments, the opportunity to rebuild economic activity, the integration of communities, and a restoration of relationships among people, whether they are ethnic Russian, Ukrainian, Tartar, or anything else. Um, that opportunity can only be created by a genuine peace, and that can only come about by the withdrawal of Russian forces and Russian leadership and command and control of the armed groups that are there. So this is very much on Russia to pull them out. If Russia is willing to do that, and I'm not going to take a position on whether they are or not, we'll see. Uh, if they are, uh, certainly the entire international community is ready to help. We want to see peace in Ukraine. We want to see the restoration of normality. We want to see people get back to normal lives. We want to see safety and security of all people that are there, whether they're ethnic Russian or ethnic Ukrainian or anything else. And I know that Russia sees Ukraine in a special way as part of its greater empire or greater um, uh, orbit of countries that have a, an affinity, a Slavic identity. That's up to Russia to compete as it wishes with the hearts and minds of Ukrainians, whoever they may be, but peacefully uh, and legally. And right now we're seeing an illegal and violent occupation of part of Ukraine. And that is frankly backfiring on Russia because it's creating a more unified, more nationalist, more Western-oriented Ukraine than ever existed before the conflict began. So I hope that we are able to remember what happened, speak frankly, and then look ahead. And looking ahead, uh, given as bad as 2017 was, we really need to make every effort to push to make 2018 the best year since the conflict began, and hopefully bring about genuine peace. And if that can be done through the withdrawal of Russian forces and a peacekeeping force, uh, certainly we are ready to do everything possible to help. So.
Thank you very much for having me. I wish you all the best for your conference today. And I turn it back to John. So. Kurt, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Well, I'm going to ask our panelists to come up, and then I'll briefly introduce them, and we'll begin our conversation. Immediate to my left is Ambassador Senator Sarah Mendelson, who was at the UN and who is a noted expert on peacekeeping. Um, to her left is Alexei Melnik from the Rosenkopf Center, de Deputy Director, also deeply, deeply an expert on Ukrainian national security. And then after that is Evelyn Farkas, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, and a noted commentator on all things Eurasian. And to her left is Ambassador Sandy Vershbaugh, U.S. Ambassador to Moscow, uh, Ambassador to NATO, as well as Deputy Director General, of, Deputy Secretary General of NATO until very recently. And I believe you have more information on them. I will not, I will not uh, go further into this so we can have our conversation. And um, I'd like to give Mr. Mjolnik the first opportunity to comment on what Kurt Volker said and how you see things in Dunbar. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I, I can hardly add anything uh, to the probably one of the best descriptions uh, of the Ukrainian conflict, how it started and where, where we are. Uh, perhaps, uh, and also I'd, I'd like to emphasize one of the uh, points that's ma made by the ambassador about the importance to remember how it started and importance to speak friend uh, frankly. Uh, James Sher from Chatham House recently published an article uh, which is called a classic Putin gambit about the peacekeeping proposals of the Russian Federation. And at the beginning of the article, there is a question, is this a perfect trap for Ukraine? And uh, I would probably uh, agree with the, his uh, first statement and uh, would uh, say that, yes, this is a trap, but I would not uh, say it is a perfect. There are different opinions about the Russia's proposal on the peacekeeping forces. Uh, one is, uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, not a trap for Ukraine, but the second, this is an opening window for diplomacy. I would suggest probably uh, to take a chance as a window uh, for diplomacy, but uh, uh, what is important to keep in mind that this was designed as a trap for Ukraine. Uh, also, uh, there are some proposals which I, I'd like to mention about the three-stage approach to the uh, performance of the peacekeeping operation. First is a line of separation. Second is a full control access, including border. And then establishing transitional administration, preparing this country for election and uh, for the reconciliation. I would probably optimistically see the only first stage to be implemented as it suits to the Russian interests. Uh, my next point is about the importance of key issues uh, regarding preconditions uh, that should be considered when we trying to implement or negotiate the Russian proposal. First, this is about uh, the clarity that we need to mention the parties to the conflict. Because as long as we have Ru Russia as a mediator and a peacekeeper, we will probably uh, have the same problems that we have now with the Minsk agreement. Uh, second, it's about the potential spoilers, which is a classic of uh, uh, doing any peacekeeping operations. Of course, there will be potential spoilers from the Ukrainian side, but definitely there will be spoilers from the Russian side. And the difference is that the Ukrainian government, and should admit, will not be able to control fully the Ukrainian spoilers. But what I am sure that the Russian government will try everything possible, and it can and it will control and use its Russian spoilers to undermine the peacekeeping operation and the, any uh, stage when it suits the Russian interests. And my last point, uh, that uh, we should be also very careful when we uh, when we see what we can achieve with the uh, Russian proposal of the peacekeeping operation. Perhaps we can stop violence in Donbas, but at the same time, I think we have a huge risk of having, uh, by stopping violence in Donbas, especially when people 
put so much attention to the full implementation of the political part of the Minsk agreement that by stopping violence in one part of Ukraine, we can create a much wider and dangerous conflict on the rest of Ukraine. Thank you, um, let me say. Um, Sarah, if you could talk a little bit about peacekeeping overall and how that applies to Donbass, given your vast experience. Thank you, thank you for uh, gathering us here today. Um, I think it's important uh, to take a, a leaf from Václav Havel's book in terms of taking seriously the proposition that there might be a peacekeeping operation. Even if it's an intellectual exercise, let's pretend as if this were uh, a genuine uh, uh, offer. Um, I think actually in looking at remembering lessons from various peacekeeping operations, we need to make sure that not only this, the, there's no um, parties to the conflict are involved in, in the peacekeeping operations, but that actually this is a real test for the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations. And so the Secretary General would need to appoint a very strong, competent SRSG, a special representative of the Secretary General. Uh, this SRSG would have to have control over both a peacekeeping force, but also a interim uh, civilian administration. The Secretary General came into office um, wanting to reform uh, the UN in general, but also specifically to have uh, peacekeeping forces not be involved in corruption, not be involved in uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. And this could be a model uh, peacekeeping force if that were to, uh, to pertain. Um, so you'd have to have, the UN often ta talks about a zero tolerance policy. Um, but we know that there's a lot of corruption and um, abuse in peacekeeping forces. This would be a real test, uh, and it could involve, if there were um, crimes committed, actually following through to make sure that any peacekeeper that was involved in the crimes, having um, uh, a either court in, in place or making sure that the country of origin is, is prosecuting. Um, there's one new role that I think we haven't seen in a peacekeeping operation, but reflects the 21st century um, role of social media, and that is disinformation. Peacekeeping operations generally haven't addressed the issue of social media or information in a comprehensive way. Given the role of social media in life today, but also in specific politics, um, we'd have to think seriously, uh, comprehensively, and possibly with companies about, which is a very new role, what uh, could be put in place in terms of making sure this peacekeeping operation had some um, role, some anticipation of the role of, of disinformation. Um, why don't I stop there? Okay, that's good. Um, Evelyn, uh, I'd be interested in anything you have to say regarding what the speakers have said thus far. Okay. So uh, first of all, I agree 100% that when there is an opportunity for diplomacy, for discussing a potential peacekeeping operation, we should seize it. And, I, and as a rule, I generally try to agree with anything Václav Havel wrote or said. <laughs> um, so that's the Eastern European American in me um, and huge fan of Václav Havel. So I think that, that having said that, However, there's a, there's a big but here, which is that I'm incredibly skeptical that this Kremlin, that this president really wants a true solution to the situation in the Donbass to say nothing about Crimea. So I, I think you have to have a big, you have to be carrying a big, huge block of salt with you <laughs> to the negotiating table. I commend Kurt for the excellent work that he's doing because he's talking with all parties, including the Russian party which gets me to a little bit reflecting on and building upon what was just said up to now. If you have a peacekeeping force, we must bear in mind that the Russians are a party to the conflict, which means they cannot be part of any peacekeeping force. And that's important to underline because right now the Russians, they have been participating in the OSCE mission um, and they have not been very constructive in that context. There, is, there are a number of things that have started to alarm me and make me think that that this discussion about a peacekeeping operation may be really in, intended to fail on the part of the Kremlin, and that is that the Russian government likes to uh, have, a, have control over Ukraine's sovereign decision-making over the political process. 
And the situation thus far has been more or less manageable for Kyiv, for the Russian government, uh, for, sorry, for the Ukrainian government. But as Kurt mentioned, there's an uptick in fighting. And the Russians recently withdrew from something called, I think it was a joint consultative committee. But in any event, it was a Russian-Ukrainian military-to-military communication channel, similar to the channel that the US has and the Israelis have with the Russians in the Middle East, so in the Syria context. It's basically kind of deconfliction, making things <coughs> sure things don't get too out of control, too overheated. And I think it, while it wasn't going to solve any problems, it did keep a break, I guess, on the fighting. And it alarms me that that's now being dismantled. Um, so I see uh, Putin as f kind of looking for pretexts um, potentially to ratchet up the military heat further uh, in order to put pressure on the United States and our allies and certainly on Ukraine. So I'm very skeptical about the current process, this peacekeeping um, proposal, and whether it will go anywhere. And ultimately, I don't believe that Russia will cede control over its shared border with Ukraine, which is ultimately what will be necessary uh, to an international peacekeeping force. Okay. Um Sandy, you've heard what everyone has said so far. Mm -hmm. You also brought to my attention a very interesting piece by Andrei Kartunov, Andrei Kartunov a couple of weeks ago on peacekeeping. And your thoughts would be most welcome. OK. Well, thanks. And it's good to have this opportunity uh, to discuss a possible peacekeeping force in uh, the Donbass, even though I share the skepticism of the other panelists about uh, Putin's intentions in floating his original proposal back in September. Uh, but it's still the right thing to do to put the Russians to the test at the bargaining table. And I'm glad that's what Kurt has been doing in his three, uh, I'm sure, very pleasant uh, exchanges with Vladislav Surkov. Uh, it's not surprising that, uh, as we've heard, Surkov uh, backtracked somewhat in uh, the most recent meeting in Belgrade. Uh, even though Ukrainian resolve and Western unity on sanctions uh, have thwarted Putin's Novorossiya project, he still may not yet have concluded that it's time to cut his losses in the Donbass, despite the financial expense of, uh, of this illegal occupation, as well as the continued burden of sanctions. And in fact, he may see prolonging the status quo as uh, his best option, in the, at least in the near term, with presidential elections coming up in Russia, but also with the recent turmoil that's erupted in, uh, in Kiev, uh, because after all, occupying the Donbass is just a means to an end, destabilizing Ukraine and undermining its chances for a European future. And, uh, so if there's new instability in Ukraine, no need to move right now. But his calculus may change after the elections. Uh, so we, uh, we need to start planning now for that scenario. Uh, the challenge is to convince Putin that time is not on his side uh, and that it's in Russia's interest to implement Minsk, give the Donbass back to Ukraine, uh, get out from under the burden of sanctions through that step, uh, but also to convince him that a robust peacekeeping force, much more robust than what he proposed in September, is needed. <clears throat> so let me offer a little more detail uh, on so, so what, a, what a peacekeeping force might uh, look like. We're, first of all, we're not talking about peace enforcement. Uh, success depends on Russia's agreement to uh, implement Minsk uh, on Russian consent, uh, but we can't count on Russia's political goodwill at the same time. And while Minsk defines an adequate end state and sets some key milestones uh, to, uh, to get to that end state, uh, it lacks any real implementation mechanism. So this isn't a question of, of changing Minsk so much as elaborating or expanding Minsk. A robust uh, peacekeeping force could serve as the, as the cover for the Russians to do what they have to do, which is to withdraw their uh, uh, thousands of uh, officers and soldiers uh, without insignias as they may be from the, uh, the Donbass remove the uh, massive arsenal of equipment that they've given to the separatists, and uh, also disband the uh, illegal militias, as Minsk requires, in both uh, Lugansk and uh, Donetsk. Once in place along the international border, which is a sine qua non for any peacekeeping force, uh, it would ensure that the Russians were not able to bring back in forces or equipment <coughs> uh, as they've been doing with impunity for the last four years. Now, by postponing the entry of Ukrainian armed forces and police until the end of a transitional period, the peacekeeping force would, uh, in a way, respond to Putin's purported concern about the uh, possibility for reprisals against uh, the local population, what he called the Ukrainian Srebrenica, uh, 
even though those concerns are wildly exaggerated. And indeed, uh, in thinking about why Putin would do this, he could uh, declare victory by saying that uh, the international community had uh, accepted his concerns and taken responsibility for the safety of Russians and Russian speakers in the, in the Donbass. Now, the arrival of UN peacekeepers would create the stable conditions for encouraging IDPs and refugees to return, uh, as well as for beginning to restore industrial and agricultural production. Uh, they would probably have a big responsibility in demining uh, parts of the uh, occupied territories. And I think, ideally, the mandate uh, should draw upon the experience of the UN in uh, eastern Slavonia, in, uh, in Croatia, back in uh, the mid-90s, and also uh, inclu including establishment of an interim civilian administration that could uh, restore competent governance and criminal justice uh, following the disbandment of the corrupt DNR and LNR uh, institutions. This would uh, allow a more gradual return of Ukrainian political and judicial institutions, which may not be immediately welcome uh, by the local population after they've been subject to uh, four years of uh, Russian state propaganda. <coughs> now, the most important task for the peacekeeping force would be to create the secure conditions for holding elections, which is the uh, pivotal element of Minsk. Uh, internationally certified elections uh, would unlock other political aspects of Minsk, such as implementation of the special status law, uh, the actual carrying out of an amnesty, and it would open the way to the eventual reestablishment of Ukrainian control over the international border uh, a few months, presumably, after these elections. Now, a couple more thoughts. Uh, any peacekeeping force, uh, even with a good mandate, uh, would need to deploy very rapidly in order to uh, quickly take the place of the Russian and Russian-led forces and minimize the period in which they were operating side by side with those forces, which could be a pretty volatile combination, even in the best case. But rapid deployment isn't exactly the United Nations forte. Uh, typical UN peacekeeping missions sometimes take many months, six months, to uh, do, go through the force generation process and uh, the logistical challenges of uh, arriving uh, on the territory. So there may be advantages to delegating the execution of a UN Security Council mandate to a multinational coalition of the willing uh, under the direction of a strong SRSG, as uh, Sarah mentioned. And the troop contributing nations clearly couldn't include Russia or Ukraine. Uh, uh, presumably NATO countries would be uh, not exactly uh, Russia's first choice either. So uh, perhaps some non-NATO European countries, such as Sweden, Finland, Austria, or Switzerland, a few of the CIS countries that don't have uh, bad relations with Kiev, such as Kazakhstan, maybe Armenia, and maybe some countries from, uh, from outside uh, Europe. Uh, the Mongolians are always ready to, to deploy. Uh, maybe countries from Latin America, uh, Japan, Australia. There's many possibilities. Uh, but the force would probably have to be pretty st substantial. I've seen estimates ranging from 20,000 to as high as 50,000. So uh, force generation, even using a coalition of the willing approach, is not going to be uh, a simple task. So there's a lot of other questions which we can talk about, you know, the relationship to the OSCE, the duration of the mission. Uh, especially tricky, we'll be dealing with the local militias which are permitted under M Minsk even after the uh, dismantlement of the illegal armies uh, that are now there. Uh, and of course, we focus very heavily on how to persuade Putin that it's in his interest to, uh, to do all this uh, and to do it in a real way and not uh, in a half-hearted way. But uh, we shouldn't underestimate the difficulty of getting the Ukrainians uh, to actually deliver their side of the bargain. Uh, while President Poroshenko was the first to propose a peacekeeping force, and I think he's still showing a readiness to, to follow through, uh, the Minsk agreements have, uh, saw, have, have had a declining popularity among Ukrainian elites and veterans of the, uh, the anti-terrorist operation uh, over the last three and a half years. Uh, and skeptics are rightfully pointing out that the terms of Minsk were imposed on Ukraine at the barrel of a gun, that uh, even if the Russians did deliver on everything that they promised, uh, there would still be a kind of Trojan horse effect of uh, even newly elected authorities in, uh, in the Donbass. Uh, and they uh, suspect that the Russians might use ambiguities in the mandate to uh, suspend implementation before uh, following through with the final step, which is returning the border to Ukrainian control. Uh, 
And there's a bitter experience that the Georgians can tell you about in terms of uh, UNOMIG in, uh, in the 90s, uh, basically turning the region not into a integral part of Georgia, but into a UN-protected frozen conflict, which is exactly what we should avoid uh, in going down this road in the Donbas. So there are a lot of pitfalls, a lot of challenges, even in, in defining the mandate, much less in actually executing it. But still, I don't see any other way out of this. Uh, and if the Russians really want to see a normalization of relations with the United States and the West, uh, and they've heard this directly from President Trump, uh, they, need, they need to fix Ukraine and Donbass as the place to start. Sandy, you set up wonderfully the next round of this conversation, focusing on both, you know, it, can we talk about Russia actually moving forward in a positive way, and for that matter, what about Ukraine and its commitments on, on Minsk? So let, let's pick up that second thread first. And I'd like to have Alexei comment. Uh, that it, it is true that Minsk is extremely controversial in Ukraine. Uh, if, in fact, Ukrainian uh, acceptance of the Minsk terms for the local elections in the occupied territories and for some form of possible? I don't think so. Uh, because even yesterday, a uh, number of MPs and leaders of political forces that are in parliament uh, made some very strong statements against what you just mentioned. And uh, also, I think the problem was as actually incorporated in the Minsk itself, because President Poroshenko, for good or bad, actually accepted some of the commitments that is not in his power regarding constitution and decision to be made by the parliament. And we remember that back in 2015, when President Poroshenko made everything possible to get through the decision regarding the constitution to the parliament, for Ukrainian soldiers lost their lives in front of the parliament. Uh, so I, I'm quite pessimistic about uh, the uh, ability of the Ukrainian political leadership to implement uh, the political part of the Minsk agreement. Having said that, I would probably, the last thing I would support is to encourage the Ukrainian government or force Ukrainian government, Ukrainian president, to implement the political part of the Minsk agreement. All right. Um, does anyone else want to comment on, on this point? If not, I, I have something to say. <laughs> uh, I think that you're, you're right that this is a very difficult political issue in Ukraine. And you have cited, um, I would say, evidence as to why this might be impossible. Uh, I would comment on the basis of a fair amount of experience in Ukraine, albeit not nearly as much as yours, that uh, there is a propensity in, in the Ukrainian political class, unfortunately, to play politics with national security. And what we're seeing here is precisely the politicization of a national security issue. My sense from conversations with many of the people who have issued these statements is that in private they're not quite as outspoken and intransigent as they are in public. I don't rule out the possibility that if a real deal were to be in prospect, that strong uh, advocacy by Ukraine's friends in Washington, in Brussels, in Berlin, might pull us in the right direction on these <laughs> issues. I'm not saying it's a sure thing. But I believe that there's some flexibility here, which we will see if the prospect were to loom. Which, of course, leads to the second thread, which is, is it possible that the Russians can turn out to be serious? We've heard a great deal of skepticism. Uh, it is true that when Putin mentioned his proposal in September, we all said it was insufficient but interesting. It's also true we've seen a variety of thinkers in Russia. I mentioned Kartuna, but there's also uh, Trenin. There's also the Arbatovs, or the Abatovi, um, who've all spoken or written in relatively positive ways. So how do we persuade the Kremlin to, in fact, give back the occupied territories of Donbass? And how do we give Putin a way out? Is this at all possible? And Sandy, I'll, I'll give you the first shot at this. Well, I think uh, it's all about generating more leverage. Uh, one thing that the administration uh, still hasn't done, even though it keeps saying it's about to do it, is uh, 
to make a, a decision on uh, lethal defensive weapons for Ukraine, not to embolden them to try to win this on the battlefield, which would be uh, uh, a failure if they tried it and would, it would cost them all their Western support, um, but to kind of show Putin that uh, prolonging this indefinitely could ultimately increase the cost to Russia. Uh, that Russian forces would suffer more casualties if there were new dust-ups along the line of contact. Uh, and we know that given their efforts to suppress any evidence of uh, casualties that this is a sensitive <laughs> point at home. Uh, but I think the main appeal for Putin would be you know, seeing a way out of the international doghouse that he's been in for the last four years. I know despite the bravado that they don't give a damn, uh, the West needs to come to them. We know that the sanctions have an impact, but also being uh, ostracized from the international top tables uh, is not uh, a situation Putin wants to remain in indefinitely. And he's seen that the ability to get a sweetheart deal with the Trump administration has, has evaporated uh, with a little help from the Congress. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I think uh, getting out from under sanctions and the broader isolation would be the main incentive. And as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, being able to say and this would be a kind of a face saver vis-a-vis -vis Russian nationalists, that he saved the poor, innocent Russians and Russian speakers in the Donbass from, from, from massacres uh, by getting the international community to take responsibility for their protection. Uh, so uh, on, on getting sanctions relief, of course, he needs to be convinced that that will actually be delivered. Uh, and the legislation makes it very hard for the president to, uh, to, to lift sanctions without explicit per permission. Uh, so I think Kurt would need to be given sort of some uh, ironclad assurances that he's already consulted with the Congress as well as with the administration and that he, that he can deliver sanctions relief if Putin delivers on Minsk. But if I could add on this topic, um, I think w it, another part of our leverage and, and obviously <coughs> someone who fought very hard for the lethal defensive uh, weapons to Ukraine which the Trump administration has now authorized the Georgian government to purchase from the United States. Um, I would love it if we did the same with Ukraine because, I, as you said, Sandy, I believe it puts important leverage on the uh, Russian government. Um, but there's also the other aspect which has to do with sanctions. I think we need to communicate clearly that if, if there is no deal, if, if Russia doesn't start behaving in Donbass, that there will be increased sanctions mm -hmm. because I believe, yeah. knowing Congress, they're not going to just sit and let the last piece of legislation stand. Um, they're going to add to it, and they already have lots of ideas, I know from personal communications with folks on the Hill, of things that they can do that would be more draconian in terms of shutting down Russian, Russian ability to get capital from overseas sure. as one example. So um, I think that Putin should understand that if he doesn't make a deal, He's going to be looking at more sanctions, more leverage, whether that's coming from the White House, which it, that's unlikely. <laughs> it's more likely to come from the Hill. Uh, however, that could be used by Kurt to say, you better make a deal, because otherwise these sanctions are, are, are on their way. So I think that's important. The other point is that even if he makes a deal on Crimea, uh, sorry, on Donbass, he, the Kremlin is still looking at sanctions in the context of Crimea. And I do not believe that Western Europe and the United States will stand down on that, that we will give up on that. I know many people are skeptical, but I believe that we will stand firm. And, and if we don't, Congress will stand firm and people like me will put pressure on them. You know, <laughs> we'll all do our best. Um, because even if there's a deal in Donbass, we cannot merely turn the page on the crime that occurred in, in Crimea. Because <laughs> we're seeing ripple effects of that daily. I mean, I, you know, this decision on Monday by the Austrian government to issue passports to Italian citizens who are living in Sudtirol, which of course was historically part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now is part of the state of Italy since World War, end of World War I or World War II. In any event, um, having a dual passport in and of itself is not a problem, but the way that they're going about it is very uh, alarming to me. Uh, and and it's, it's, we already have seen the Hungarian Prime Minister Orban respond to the Crimea illegal annexation by talking about the Hungarian minorities in Central Eastern Europe. That means five countries where there are Hungarian minorities, including Ukraine. Uh, you know, this meddling in your neighbor's business based on ethnic nationalism can come to a very bad end if we don't keep a strong eye on it. So I think that's another reason why we have to stand firm on Crimea. Thank you.
Um, Sarah. A number of years ago, I was involved in a project in Russia um, looking at public opinion around uh, Chechnya. And what we found was uh, intense emotion around the cost of the war and, the ca and casualties, just like Americans uh, thinking about uh, war. Uh, I think this issue of, of casualties is uh, a leverage point. Um, and it is, it's, a, it's a place where uh, the Russian government and Russians in general are, are sensitive. I think the more that we can do to create if not facts on the ground, then facts on a piece of paper and really fleshing out what this peacekeeping operation would look like. Numbers, uh, I take Sandy's point about the force generation. I think even the possibility of <clears throat> generating commitments from countries would be important right now. And there's the possibility that this could really be uh, a state of the art, if you will, peacekeeping operation in the sense of enhanced role for women in a peacekeeping operation. Oftentimes when people are writing about this possibility that they're acting as if it would be all men. And there's absolutely no reason that it should be empirically. We know that when women are involved, uh, the peace deal is more likely to stick. But also that there's um, a way in which the community involved in humanitarian assistance is evolving in a paradigm shift so that you'd, you'd be doing joint needs assessment. You'd really have to have the ability to get information from people on the ground in terms of what they need, rather than from UN agencies doing a kind of uh, supply side. You want a demand driven. Um, so I think, you know, sort of stepping outside the Ukraine Russia uh, frame, there's a lot in terms of trying to make this a, an example of a 21st century peacekeeping operation. Okay, thank you. Oh, so do you also want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, if I may to share uh, some of my experience, because Slavonia had been mentioned a couple of times here, and uh, I had a chance to spend eight months in eastern Slavonia when I was in military uniform back in mid-90s. And uh, also, I, I do support the importance of the uh, not just the number of troops, rapid deployment, because if you compare Slavonia, it was such a mm -hmm. tiny area in east of Croatia, uh, if you compare with Donbass. And the, the rough estimation that we all need probably, the lowest number is 20,000. But uh, I, I would suggest probably think about 50 in order to get something in between. Uh, second, about the quality of troops. Because in Slavonia, we had uh, four battalions, and uh, uh, we, have, we had force commander which was Belgian general, NATO general. I think it was one of the important points to have NATO there, both peacekeeping and backup. And uh, mandate, of course, should be strong mandate. And also, we should be aware that uh, at any case of uh, a provocation, when the UN Peace Force will have to use this mandate, uh, we have very high risk of get in direct confrontation with the Russian Federation. Because unlike in Slavonia, where a, Serb, a Serbian side was uh, actually persuaded by the international community not to interfere, and there was a natural border, Danube River, which is, again, if you compare to, to situation. Even then, uh, me as a, a commander of Ukrainian helicopters had to uh, use uh, or my power to test helicopters to, to work against Croatian special force, against uh, uh, gangs that operated in the area. So we should be aware that if Russia is not separated from its involvement, not persuaded to interfere in their affairs, we will risk quite a kind of direct confrontation with the Russian Federation. Okay, okay. Sandy. Yeah, I agree completely with what Alexei uh, pointed out. And I think there is a lot of lessons to be learned. I forgot that Ukraine had forces as part oh, yeah. of UNTES, uh, which is a, we had two squadrons a, a positive company. bit of irony <laughs> as we discuss this issue. But I think that uh, thinking about the kinds of capabilities that this, this presence will need, it needs to include military elements, police elements, as well as some of the civil, civil administration uh, functions that uh, will be needed to govern this, uh, this now occupied space during a transitional period. So it is going to require a lot of resources and a lot of commitments from nations. And as Sarah said, it's not too soon to start uh, 
soliciting volunteers, including a lead nation. Uh, I know Sweden has been uh, mm -hmm. encouraged to t take this role. I'm not sure they've accepted yet. <laughs> not exactly. Uh, uh, well, it's not a poison chalice, but it's going to be a challenge. Uh, but uh, it, particularly the police side and keeping civil order when the uh, the thugs have uh, left the scene, uh, vetting and training and standing up uh, new local police forces. I think that also will be a function of this presence. So it's got multiple duties and it's going to require tens of thousands of personnel. I think it would be a wonderful idea to begin to recruit for this. This would be a way to maintain this issue in high profile and increase pressure on Moscow. I'd like to offer one observation before we move to the next, event, next stage of this event. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, an important connection between what happens politically in, in Ukraine and the overall situation in Donbass and the prospects for peace. If you look carefully at how Moscow has judged their, their situation in Donbass, you'll see the following things. Uh, after our presidential election last year, or even before that, from the time that candidate Trump emerged as the likely Republican nominee, Russian willingness to negotiate seriously in the then Surkov Newland Channel ceased. Because they were looking for a free way out via an American policy that would be friendly towards them at the expense of Ukraine. And after Trump won the election, you could almost hear, you could, see, you could hear the shouts of joy in Moscow, and you saw in the, um, in the academic press uh, articles suggesting no compromise coming from Moscow on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That cease, that, that, that sort of uh, jubilation and unwillingness to compromise ceased by late spring of this year as they saw what was happening in Washington, how the instincts of the president to make nice with the Kremlin at the expense of Ukraine had come to naught. And Congress especially, as Sandley mentioned, began to push uh, for sanctions. But, but uh, more recently, especially as a result of the peculiarities in Ukraine with the fighting over the Anti-Corruption Bureau, with the unusual circumstances of Misha Saakashvili, uh, there's been a little bit of a rethink. You might say an easy rethink in Moscow is evidenced by some things put in the press, some conversations people have had, suggesting, well, they can just wait until Ukraine once again plunges into turmoil. And that may explain, I'm not saying by itself it explains, but that may explain a certain hardening we've seen in the Kremlin position uh, over the past six or so weeks, including the statement by Sirkov, uh, the bad meeting in, in Belgrade, the last bad group meeting in Belgrade. So just, it, this is another example where it would be very useful if people in power in Kiev understood the implications on national security of their 24-7 focus on political advantage. And with that, I've, I've, I think I've pontificated enough. <laughs> uh, we have, this, this, this event has had a great deal of interest. It's generated a great deal of interest in Ukraine. We had several very, very knowledgeable people from Ukraine who wanted to join the panel after we were already full. So we couldn't, we couldn't um, accommodate them on the panel, but I'm going to give the, first, the floor first to someone who has something to say on this, um, Andriy Nikolayenko, who is, was a former first deputy governor of Donetsk, as well as he's the head of the state agency on Donbass recovery. He will offer some comments on what's, ha what's happened under five minutes, yes? Yeah, sure. And then we'll open up to questions. Uh, thank you, first of all, Ambassador Herbst. Thank you very much uh, for everyone who arranged this absolutely important and uh, crucial meeting today because uh, I highly appreciate that the United States uh, now much deeper in wall in all peace process in Ukraine than it was uh, even one year ago, and uh, Ambassador uh, Walker uh, is doing great job, having just uh, already three meetings with Mr. Surko. But I would like to uh, bring us to the beginning when it was funny but a very important mistake. Like you said, it's uh, flash uh, future Europe or fla uh, future of Ukraine. <laughs> so it's it's maybe it looks like a joke, but it's really true. And uh, as has been mentioned, uh, now future of Europe, whole Europe, is now creating in Ukraine. If we accept ex annexion of Crimea, if we accept uh, this uh, Donbass conflict uh, in Russian scenario, it's, it will ruin uh, Europe 
uh, security system, what has been made by Helsinki first. So when we are talking about Ukraine, uh, we have to understand that uh, there are some uh, ideas in Ukraine at uh, also how uh, peace on our territory can be done. And uh, I'm very upset that the uh, uh, pr first proposal about peacekeeping mission came to United Nations, not from Ukraine, but from Russia. And now we all discuss a Russian version of uh, this uh, resolution. Uh, two years ago in Munich Security Conference, uh, Mr. Teruta, the friend of mine uh, who I work with in Donetsk, proposed the idea to the President Poroshenko why we don't uh, use the possibility when Ukraine will lead the UN Security Council and do not raise that issue. Unfortunately, we wait till September when Putin did, and now we discuss the Russian version. But I'm very appreciative to Ambassador Vershbo uh, for uh, stressing one uh, time by one that uh, extremely important part of peacekeeping mission is uh, it's a civil administration. Because we have prepared uh, one year ago the plan which called like three pillars uh, about legitimacy, security, and trust. And uh, it's absolutely important security, but without legitimate power on that territory, we cannot uh, re uh, reunite Ukraine and just bring Donbass back. When uh, we are coming back to Minsk agreement, it's, I'm absolutely uh, agree with my Ukrainian colleague that uh, I'm absolutely skeptic that Minsk agreement milestone, as we mentioned, can be accepted by Ukrainian society. Unfortunately, President Poroshenko has no all uh, full right when we, he signed it or agreed on that version. And uh, I've been next to the radar on the 31st of August 2015 when it happened, this bombing and uh, this policeman has been killed. And uh, I, I, I'm absolutely sure that trying to go through Ukrainian parliament, especially now when the last poll shows a very less level of support from the people of Ukraine to the final, uh, parliament as institution, uh, will blow up whole Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian situation. So first of all, uh, we, I, I know it's unpopular, but it's real thing. We have to think about changing the format. Normandy format plus means format, it's, um, now, after the three years, it's made some achievement, but it's not efficient anymore. Uh, without the United States on the table, uh, like Kurt Walker is doing now, uh, any peace can be not achieved. It's my vision, it's not only my vision. When we are, uh, when we are saying about Minsk, we have to keep in mind that Minsk is a former Soviet Union uh, Republic. And if we need the really natural place, maybe we need to look for us a really natural place, not NATO member, not Russian Defense Union, but maybe something like Vienna. So we are proposing to take care about Vienna as the headquarter of OECD to the place where the peace can be discussed and where many, many, and OECD as a mediator for that negotiation. Another important thing is mandate of uh, peacekeeping mission. And when we start to talk from peacekeeping, then we have to find who's a, our counterpart. And this is the Russian scenario, where they say, oh, okay, Kiev has to talk its internal conflict with this uh, guy's terrorist. We need to, uh, if Ukraine propose a uh, scenario and way, our version of resolution, then Kiev, who, is a, uh, who has full sovereignty on that territory and control territory also, can propose to United Nations, to all international community, to help with sta establishing international interim administration. And only after that, we can try to re reun uh, reunite Ukraine. And another crucial thing, it's about election. After four years of propaganda, it's absolutely impossible to have any kind of election on that territory. With armed people, without armed people, so we need transition period. And uh, if we come back to Minsk agreement, we can find the one point which talking about constitution. And uh, Russian propaganda and some speakers trying to use it, yeah, one minute, uh, just the one, uh, <laughs> trying to use it as Ukraine has to adopt changes to constitution, but it's not true. If we look deeply in Minsk agreement, that about adopting new version of constitution. And what is the difference? 
that Russian all times put us on a track that we have to adopt some special rights to only for these two regions. But this is what Ukrainian society never will accept. Why the people in Donetsk and Lugansk has different uh, rights than people in Transcarpathia, which is now has special special story and special thing with Hungarian, for example. So when we are talking about new Ukraine, our idea uh, as a team, as a people who spend many years in Donetsk and understand the uh, nature of that conflict, we need uh, to talk about new constitution of Ukraine, the constitution of the people of Ukraine, <coughs> because constitution of Ukraine, it's not a real base uh, it's very different than United States. It's very easy to explain. Your constitution started by words, we are the people of United States, and that's what people agree to do. But Ukrainian constitution started by words, we are Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine on behalf of the people. So, and Verkhovna Rada now has only 2%. It's, true. It's, not true. it's true. Open the constitution. Open the constitution in the Wikipedia, it's easy. So, I, I'm sure that it's true. So. What, I, what we expect that after this internal administration can be uh, established, and I believe in that, on that territory, we need to involve the people after the propaganda just to create a new Ukraine, not just to give the chance only to elect representative to Verkhovna Rada. So this process can unite Ukraine and create Ukrainian national idea, how we, what kind of Ukraine we need to build, what kind of the right can be on the local level, not only Eastern Ukraine, but in center and west. It can be the process what can unite Ukraine. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, floor is open. Oh, can, I, can I just make a quick point Please. on that? Because I think this was really interesting and actually gives me a little bit of hope because there were some very important points that were made here that I would uh, I absolutely agree with, obviously, on Transcarpathia. The idea that certain groups in certain geographic areas should have special autonomies. Um, you have to be very careful about, so I think that's a very uh, wise comment. The other point about elections, as somebody who worked in Bosnia in the 1996 and 1997 on the elections there, the absolute worst thing we did initially, unfortunately, was reflexively go to elections. It's an easy way for the international community to check the box and go home. But the problem was, if you don't have a transition period, you just lock in the, the nationalist extremes, and there's no chance for the moderate middle. You know, there was a party in, in Bosnia, I, I'm going to forget now their, their um, name, but they, were, they, were, they had a chance. Um, but we, the international community, didn't give enough time for them to build the coalition and to actually uh, have a chance in the election. So I just want to underline that, that it's a very important point about elections, too. Okay, please. Very short. We just heard one of the representatives of Donetsk. Right. And why it is important? Because every time when uh, Putin speaks about the representatives on Donbass, he doesn't mean people, because we have 1.5 IDPs from Donbass in Ukraine. 1.5 million, yes. Uh, 1.5 million, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Excuse <laughs> correction. And that, that, that's, that is very important, because the representative of Donbass, not just uh, Mr. Zaharchenko and Kind of. Yeah, I think Mr. Tarut has a better claim on Donbass than Mr. Zaharchenko. Okay, first question over here, Mr. Panamariyov. Please identify yourself. Yeah, uh, Ilya Panamariyov. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, someone was coming with a microphone. Uh, Ilya Panamariyov, and uh, thanks for having this wonderful event here and the level of the discussion. Uh, uh, what I wanted to ask is uh, just a couple of days ago, Mr. Putin had his press conference. And he was speaking about uh, peacekeeping mission. Uh, and he was saying something like, OK, so uh, we agreed on peacekeepers. Then Chancellor Merkel called me and said we should allow peacekeepers on all the territory of Donbass. And we agreed to that, but for the security issues. Uh, uh, and surprisingly enough, he admitted that security is, depend is depending on Moscow. Uh, in this situation, but then he said, but if international community is pressuring us into making a civil administration under international control, then it should go into uh, negotiations uh, with uh, uh, so-called DNR and LNR uh, uh, bosses, uh, and it's their, it's their question. Um, uh, frankly speaking, at one point of time, 
you, we will have to uh, include them in any kind of negotiations because even technically, if uh, we are talking about uh, peacekeepers without uh, uh, interacting with uh, uh, whatever they are, mobsters, separatists, wh whatever, you know, it's impossible to implement it technically. Uh, but uh, where I totally agree with Andre and Evelyn, you know, elections to legitimize them, that's the, the most disastrous thing, which is actually part of Minsk agreements. So my question is, uh, what do you think at which point of time uh, those contacts have to be started uh, with uh, the people on those uh, territories? And what can be the construct that you think would be acceptable in terms of uh, uh, peacekeeping when and if the uh, new international civil administration would be instated on those territories. Sandy? Yeah. I think the, the basis for engaging them already exists, and we shouldn't go beyond that. Under the Minsk agreements, they have represent, the separatist leaders have representation through the trilateral contact group. Uh, but uh, I think our principle should be that the political decisions on the terms of a settlement and a peacekeeping force uh, are in practice going to be decided in Moscow. And so we should be negotiating with Moscow. The separatists will have to be part of an implementation process, and I think we can use the existing mechanisms. Until a peacekeeping mission is on the ground, then it inevitably is going to have to deal with local authorities as it uh, tries to basically dismantle them and substitute a, a more impartial international uh, mission to take their place. Uh, so uh, I don't think we need to elevate their status to, to, as, as co-equals of, of Putin or Surkov. Uh, uh, we, know, we know who calls the tune. In the, in the occupied territories. Uh, but I agree that uh, elections are going to be a tricky business if we, if we rush them, as was done not just in the Balkans, but probably in many other previous situations. Uh, and that's why I'm glad Mr. Nikolaenko agrees on the importance of an international civilian administration, because this may be a long transition period. It may be a year or more before you can uh, even set a date for elections. Uh, after you judge whether the, uh, the political atmosphere has become much more, more open and, and neutral with the reintroduction of Ukrainian media and uh, uh, the removal from, of some of the more odious figures who have been terrorizing the local population. Uh, so it may take time, and it may be a, a long period of time after the elections to fully implement the results uh, and, and to ensure that there's no backsliding or, or, or upsurge in, uh, in, in new violence. Whether uh, you use this period to work on a new constitution or whether that comes later, I, I don't know. That's an internal Ukrainian matter. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I do think that uh, the, the, the negotiating uh, process, uh, uh, as Mr. Nikolaenko suggests, it doesn't need to be changed substantially in my view. I think we now have a, a good uh, parallel track approach with the U.S. and the Normandy format, and we have the Minsk, Minsk uh, Trilateral Contact Group. Uh, I think that all these different mechanisms are sufficient as long as the uh, U.S. coordinates closely with its European partners and with the Ukrainians themselves. Uh, we don't need to uh, create a different format. Uh, but uh, the peacekeeping proposal, I, I, I give credit to uh, Ukraine. I don't think it was uh, President Putin who was the first to propose this. Ukraine has been pushing this idea for several years. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily give you an advantage to be the first drafter of a Security Council resolution. <laughs> it, it gives everybody else something to shoot at. And I think that's what's been happening in New York. Okay, Evelyn, want to comment on this? Okay. Uh, no. I'm okay, Alexei, yeah. and then Sarah. Yeah. Uh, coming back to the issue of the representatives of Donbass, we should be aware that Zaharchenko or Plutnitsky, who used to be a representative, they are, they are not representatives of Donbass. Because when Plutnitsky left Donbass, all his people who he represented, they, they were placed in a couple of cars. <laughs> and that's it. And. Uh, Second, it's about the peacekeeping operation, uh, the importance of timing and consequences of the measures. Because coming back again to Eastern Slavonia, uh, one month after the full deployment of the troops, the force commander reported that on the territory of Eastern Slavonia, there were no other military force except the UN military force. All the heavy equipment, all uh, soldiers, uh, illegal formations were moved on the left bank of the Danube River. And the elections in Eastern Slavonia was the last point 
done by the transitional administration after two and a half years of stabilization, uh, reconciliation, and other issues to prepare for the elections. So my point is, again, means agreement is not something that we should be looking for because elections is the last thing to be done in Donbass. Okay, thank you. Sir. There's been a lot of talk about the uh, Eastern Slavonia mission, uh, Bosnia, Kosovo. I just want to point out that before we sort of set that as the gold standard, um, these peacekeeping missions introduced human trafficking to the Balkans. It wasn't there before. Uh, and the, the peacekeepers themselves were involved in this. So we really need to up our game in terms of explicit, strong anti-corruption and uh, a focus on this issue because it just feeds an, uh, an insecurity in the region. And this issue of, of reconciliation is extremely important. The international community is, is very good at elections. I, I say this as a former national uh, NDI person. Um, we're much less good at this issue of, let's call it the present past, this issue of historical memory. Uh, some people talk about it as transitional justice. This is the area in which a lot of, uh, not only peacekeeping missions, but transitions falter. And we need to have a much better understanding of what the needs are on the ground of people uh, reconciling, what their interest is, rather than the international community imposing some standard, so. Okay, thank you. All right, question over here. Hi, uh, Jock Mendoza Wilson from System Capital Management Group, which is the business group of uh, the Ukrainian businessman Renat Akhmetov. Um, and my question is really about how do the how do the panel, so I'm probably putting you on the spot, but how do the panel see a, a time frame? What sort of time frames are we talking about if we're to move from ceasefire to peacekeeping to administration to elections and to at some point reintegration? How do you see that in terms of the number of uh, years that that might take if we were lucky enough to uh, see progress from the, the current peace discussions. Thanks. Okay, two seven. years? <laughs> <laughs> two years, maybe two year, two and a half, three on the outside. I don't think you could sell it if it was a longer mm. transition to the skeptics in Ukraine. But you need a certain amount of time to ensure the safety of all the civilian population from on both sides of the line of contact and to uh, stand up uh, impartial institutions that can then gradually be replaced by Ukrainian institutions. And that's assuming political will on all sides. But I would yeah. probably agree with the time frame. Yeah, I'd like to ra raise another question, because I agree that it would probably take years to perform the peacekeeping operation. But what is important, I think, to communicate also to the Ukrainian government that the peacekeeping operation is the vital, very important, but only part of the conflict resolution. Because a lot of j uh, job to be done during the peacekeeping operation and after the peacekeeping operation. And I'm afraid that Ukrainian government is not doing enough in order to, to, to get prepared to take over these territories after I, I, I wish this mission will be completed, or first deployed and then completed. Okay. Uh, we have a question for, uh, right there, then over here, and then over here. So no, start, start right there, behind. Thank you. I am Alexey Garany. I am professor from Kyiv, from Kyiv Mohyla Academy. And my question is regarding the special status. It was mentioned here that uh, Ukrainian public opinion doesn't support the special status, and for obvious reasons, imagine, imagine that. Peacekeepers are there, and we are moving towards political implementation of Minsk agreements. So if there would be a special status, it would actually mean that Putin would receive what he wanted to have. He wanted to have some kind of, as Ambassador Fershbo said, Trojan horse within the body of Ukraine, which we, he could manipulate. So. Uh, Actually, aggressor would be rewarded. His initial plans would be implemented, not by military means, but by political means. And that's why Ukrainians are rejecting this idea. Thank you. Okay, anyone want to comment on this? Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, it's a very, very important issue about uh, special status and also, as you said, what Putin wants to achieve using the Donbass instrument. And there was the question uh, how to make Putin get out of Donbass. I don't think Putin needs Donbass mm. a, as such. He needs Donbass as a conflict, he needs Donbass an, as an issue. And unfortunately, uh, uh, yesterday there was published uh, the second reading of the uh, draft law on uh, reconciliation, uh, which is in the parliament now. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to download, but uh, I, we would probably have some issues to discuss what we should, we can expect. But uh, one of the key points that I, I hoped will be in this new law, that finally uh, Russia will be clearly uh, mentioned as an aggressor state, and I hope one day we will use this proper format of not anti-terror operation, but uh, interstate conflict. Yeah, thank you. Okay, question over here. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Sylwia Szabowska. I'm the Polish Assistant Defense Attaché. Uh, just before I ask question, uh, quick um, uh, information from Justice Department, translation of the Constitution of Ukraine, Supreme Soviet of Ukraine on behalf of the Ukrainian people. So just to clarify that it's Verkhovna, uh, uh, people, citizens of Ukraine of all nationalities. But Supreme, uh, Supreme uh, Soviet of Ukraine is mentioned uh, as such. Questions. Uh, how NATO can be supportive to the process is the first question. And the second, uh, what must happen? Because as I understand, uh, National Security Council is, very, uh, is quite supportive to providing lethal weapons to Ukraine. What must happen that this decision is finally taken by the administration? Thank you. NATO? Well, NATO, I think uh, NATO should continue to provide the full spectrum of support that it's providing in terms of uh, assistance to defense reform, training, uh, and that goes hand in hand with the bilateral support from the U.S., Canada, Lithuania, and other countries. I, I think we should uh, you know, show our continued commitment uh, to Ukraine, both politically and in, in tangible terms, to make clear that uh, uh, we're not kind of handing Ukraine over to the Russians or uh, consigning it to some kind of neutral status, I think that would be uh, send the wrong signal and probably encourage Putin to only go halfway in implementing any deal that was, was struck. So uh, continued support uh, through uh, the initiatives NATO has taken over the last several years. Okay, yeah. Emily, you want to address the second question on arms? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the question was. I, what needs <coughs> to happen? What is necessary to make it happen? Oh, well, the president has to decide. I mean, um, from all reporting available, <laughs> public reporting, um, the decision has been prepared um, at, up to the cabinet level for the president to decide. So presumably, if he's going to do it, he, if he's so inclined, he will just have to decide which, what timing is appropriate. And maybe if there is some kind of political deal, then it would be easier as part of the deal to say, OK, we're going to give Ukraine this tool to better be able to resist any kind of new military encroachment by the Russians, any, bre any breaking of the new agreement, for example. So I think that's important. Um, I would add, just on the NATO side, you know, that, that you, it depends on what kind of agreement you have and whether Putin is open to any kind of um, guarantor, uh, you know, kind of in extremis guarantee from NATO, because we do have K4 in Kosovo, and in that case, NATO is the in extremis guarantor of security for Kosovo. So I don't so think the Russians over, over would the jump, horizon. jump yeah. into, exactly. Over the so, horizon presence. Yeah. Correct. So they're the in extremis force. They would come in it, when the other mm -hmm. forces, the local forces and um, OSCE and others have failed. So the point is that um, if, if the Russians are open to it, NATO can have a constructive role. I doubt that they would be, but that's something that could be negotiated as well. Yes, in in an effort to get a little bit of disagreement on the panel, I would say uh, this negotiation is difficult enough. I, I really I don't think having a clear role for NATO in the conversation is helpful at this point. Uh, I think it can be done under the UN auspices, uh, and that the focus should be really in trying to get states lined up right now to contribute troops. Um, I'd just like to say that in the aura of the help we just gave the Russians in stopping a terrorist incident in St. Petersburg, it would be a good time to send those javelins to Ukraine. 
<laughs> okay. Now, yes. uh, a question right here. If I may, thanks so much for discussion and. Please identify yourself. I'm. I'm also Andri. I'm also from Ukraine. I'm from Ukrainian Embassy, and as Mr. Andri was part of representing Ukraine, I just wanted to make two small short comments on his statements. Number one, we did not, it was not President Putin or Russian Federation who initiated the idea of peacekeepers from the United Nations. It was back in March 2015 when President Poroshenko enacted and Verkhovna Rada addressed the UN. And the other thing is that this is not about the formats or cities or places where people gather, and especially not about the formats. Uh, we do have Minsk, and it's the game in town we do have, and Russia has its obligation. And there was a statement by four presidents, and until it is pressed and forced to get its mercenaries and regular forces out of Ukraine, there's no reason to move it like to Vienna or any other, so I just wanted to make clear that we do have a real game, and we need to follow it until we finalize, and there's no need to move it anywhere else. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, right here. Michael Dosenko, U.S. Ukraine Business Council. Um, a number of our members, uh, both U.S. companies and Ukrainian companies, uh, lost uh, a lot of business uh, in the occupied territory. I'm not mentioning Crimea. That's a totally separate story. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the, let's be optimistic. Let's say the uh, peacekeeping operation will proceed. Uh, the countries will uh, provide the personnel and the uh, everything else that's needed there. Uh, for uh, for the IDPs to come back, obviously they would have to have jobs to come back to. In some cases, uh, the plant where they worked, uh, like an oil seed crashing plant of Cargill, uh, $200 million investment, is not there anymore. It's been taken apart and shipped to Russia in the white uh, the humanitarian convoys. Um, what uh, what kind of interaction uh, could be between the peacekeeping force and the temporary uh, administration uh, and the businesses that may want to come back uh, into Ukraine, uh, create jobs, and, and start making money again? Thanks. I mean, listen, if, jo if jobs are going to be created, this is a, a key element to a uh, secure future, a prosperous future. But for the businesses to come back, there's got to be both an end to the violence and establishment of rule of law. So it's, 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 it's on the one hand, not rocket science, but it's also uh, it's the basic fundamentals. Uh, job creation in the best of circumstances isn't always easy. Um, but if we're able to think creatively and uh, we, we get beyond the violence, then I think there's a conversation to be had. And I would just add that any deal would have that as a component of you know, bringing stability back to those regions. Uh, and any Western contribution, financial or otherwise, will include pressure on Kyiv in particular, because they need to do a better job in the parts of Ukraine that they control on rule of law, countering corruption, and creating the circumstances for the foreign investors to go in and team up with the Ukrainians, getting rid of some of these umbrella organizations. I won't go into more detail than that, but, um, but I, I think that's a very important component. And, and that is really going to be the key to the success of the Ukrainian government, whether it's you know, Ukraine with or without Donbass. Can I just say one thing? Even if there hadn't been this uh, occupation, honestly, I think that there would need to be a conversation about what kind of 21st century jobs would be created in the region. And that's really the conversation we need to have. OK, we've got a problem. We've got like five hands in four okay. minutes. I'm going to take questions, <laughs> but I'm going to cut you off at 40 seconds. <laughs> so no statements. <laughs> OK, right here. We, we can see the clock from here. <laughs> okay. Take them all at once? Yeah, I'll take them all at once, okay. and then, we can, then we'll have everyone dress up. Around. Around. Okay. Last week, uh, Elaine Soreo, WIUU in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, last week, uh, Secretary of State Tillerson made it very clear here at the Atlantic Council about the support for Ukraine. Uh, he reiterated it in a number of different ways. What I'd like to know is, and specifically addressing Crimea, 
and the, the integrity of the sovereign state. Would you please answer uh, how that could play into leverage with Mr. Putin on coming to possibly to the table for uh, peacekeeping? Okay, thank you. The, right there, this gentleman right here. Uh, hi, my name is Dimitri. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Mendelssohn. It's about the capacity of the UN to implement this 21st century peacekeeping force, how you see it as different. What, how, how big of a role does the UN play in the civil administration that we're talking about? I mean, is, just what is the role and the capacity, and also the willingness of the countries in the UN based on what happened in Libya and everything else? Thank okay. you. Okay, question right behind you, Nadia McConnell. Nadia McConnell, U.S. Ukraine Foundation. Just want to verify something. Just recently, a Ukrainian official cautioned that uh, under UN peacekeeping mission, any country that participates is then disqualified from providing any kind of defense or military assistance to that country. Okay. Is that correct? All right, finally, question right over here, and then we're, we'll give it to the panel. Thank you very much, Kovalenko, Victor, Ukrainian, Ukrainian legal group. Why there is an assumption that Ukrainian army will start massacre in Donbass after the liberation? So Ukrainian army liberated big part of Donbass, Lysychansk, Mariupol, Slavyansk, and nothing happened. So even mayors who supported Russian invasion remained in their positions. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So Sarah, there's one question for you, and then we'll go to the rest of the panel. We've talked about, we've volunteered various member states uh, to contribute troops. Uh, we talked about Sweden, Finland, Austria. I think for um, European countries, there is keen interest in having a resolution to this. So I think that there is uh, support in terms of um, sending, certainly in terms of having a peacekeeping operation, whether or not Sweden, Austria, Finland are willing to uh, send large number of troops, we need to, to test that. Um, I would not begin from the uh, position that it's not possible. I begin from the position that it is possible. I think Libya is not a good uh, analogy for the following reasons. Um, we had an ambassador killed there. And when the ambassador was murdered, it had a absolutely dramatic effect on our ability to do anything in Libya. And we forget that even after he was murdered, a few days later there was an attack on, in Tunisia on a school uh, where a lot of embassy children um, attended. Um, every car was destroyed. So the, the Libya uh, analogy uh, I think doesn't really extend here. Now if there was that kind of violence, I suppose it would ha have an effect. But I think that the interest of many member states to see, they, the, the, the stakes here are extremely high. Um, and the idea that uh, a foreign country can occupy uh, another country is uh, the quintessential erosion of norms that drive the UN. So I think everybody feels that they've got um, a stake in this. Thank you. Sorry, what I meant to say. Well, actually, sorry, sorry. Which, no, sorry. enough. All right, anyone want to address the, <laughs> so, I'm sorry, but we just don't have time. Address the question about peacekeepers not being able to provide weapons. Anyone have an answer to that question? I think it's straightforward. I mean, I, I don't know the actual answer, but my guess is that if you're a peacekeeper from a, a country that's represented, cannot provide arms. Certain that's logic to it. Logical, Sandy? Yeah. Yeah. That, that'd be, I, I'd have to check if it's a, it's a rule or just an established practice, but it, it makes sense. But on the other questions, right, uh, I think on uh, Crimea, uh, I think Secretary Tillerson was absolutely right in insisting that we will never uh, recognize Crimea as anything other than Ukrainian territory and that we should maintain our sanctions that were imposed in connection with the Crimean annexation uh, until uh, that issue is solved. But I think that the premise of what we've been talking about today is that we are willing, willing to treat the Donbass separately from Crimea. Uh, that's the, you know, Minsk is only about the Donbass and that uh, if Putin were to deliver, we should be able to uh, fulfill what we've promised, is, which is to lift those sanctions attached to the Donbass uh, uh, in return for full implementation of Minsk. Uh, that is the, the most substantial part of the sanctions package, so I think that would give some incentive to Putin, if he's looking for a way out, to make a deal on Donbass. Uh, 
recognizing that we're not going to yield uh, over the longer term as we did with the Baltics uh, during the Cold War. The, uh, uh, the last question, uh, I, I, would, I don't assume that Putin is, is serious or sincere when he's worried about uh, massacres, but I think if he's going to be looking for a sort of justification for letting go of the Donbass, claiming that the international community agreed with him and that uh, they will ensure that no, there are no ma massacres uh, is a kind of a propaganda point we should tolerate for the greater goal of getting uh, Russia forces out of uh, the Donbass. So I Ever. wanted to, to, mm -hmm. to address this, and then I'm sure Alexei has other comments, but I think this is a really important point. I would not tolerate it at all, <laughs> because I think it's part of the, this you know, social media, this mm -hmm. disinformation that Sarah talked about earlier. It's really important that that get no legs. And part of the onus is, again, on the Ukrainian government. I know uh, Toria Newland, you know, a, a former assistant secretary of state, was very actively engaging with our Ukrainian colleagues, saying, you guys have to get out um, east and talk to your people. So part of, and I know that's not always easy, but that's, that's important. Mm -hmm. So for Ukrainian to Ukrainian, grassroots conversations to occur, but also to be ready with social media campaign to explain, not even responding to the Russian propaganda, just start your own campaign explaining how you are going, how the Ukrainian army is going to behave differently, that it's a professionalized military, it's been working with the West to respect the human rights of citizens, et cetera, et cetera. And the experience in Slavyansk and Mariupol is definitely should be uh, highlighted. I agree with that. I'm really, really grateful for mentioning Crimea, which was not part of, of the discussion at the beginning. But I think Crimea is very important to, to keep uh, uh, in focus. And uh, uh, being realistic, Crimea cannot be uh, returned back to, uh, to Ukraine unless President Putin is in place, and I'm afraid that not, not only because of Mr. Putin, but uh, unless we, del we deliver a strategic defeat on Russia. And Ukraine has a significant role to play by presenting an, a, an alter alternative model for the Russian population. Uh, and I'd like to conclude with uh, what I started, uh, that the, the current peacekeeping pro proposals is made as a trap, Russia. But Minsk was also made as a trap. But we managed to make Minsk a real useful instrument to keep pressure on Russia, to maintain sanctions. And that's what I would suggest to take a chance uh, uh, to, to use it as a window for, for diplomacy, as a window of opportunity. I realize we're out of time. Um, I think a lot of us thought that December 2017 was going to be a pressure point because Ukraine is going to roll off the Security Council. I think that we need to all be thinking that 2018 is actually mm -hmm. the, the pressure point. Okay, I'd like to thank our panelists. Now, before we close, I'd like to mention two things. First, on February 6th, we're gonna have a, a big event here on cyber. Mm. It'll deal with both the Russian cyber offensive in Ukraine, as well as the more broadly the Russian cyber threat. And an issue that came up here is the question of the commercial damage Ukraine has suffered as a result of Kremlin aggression. We're going to have an event in the springtime which addresses that directly, and we'll keep you posted. And thank you all for coming today, and thank you to our panelists.